It's time to tune in to Defending the Faith with Frank Harbor. Hear the latest about religious liberty. A win for religious freedom in one of the remaining blockbuster cases facing the U.S. Supreme Court this term. A legal battle continues for the Little Sisters of the Poor for nearly a decade now. A street preacher armed with a speaker, a microphone, and a camera strapped to his chest is now banned from the village. Our founding fathers believed in the separation of church and state, but not for one fleeting moment. Did they believe in the separation of God and government? And powerful apologetics. Are you prepared to defend the faith? I'm convinced unless we trust in God, this nation is finished. We're facing a new kind of enemy. We're involved in a new kind of warfare. And we need the help of the Spirit of God. Three, two, one. Welcome to another episode of Defending the Faith. I am Frank Harbour. I am your host. I am the president and chief legal counsel of the Defending the Faith Alliance. We defend the faith. You can find out more about us online at defendingthefaith.law. You can find out about some of our religious liberty cases. We just won one recently. And so we've got stuff going on right now all across the country. We're doing some amazing legal things. Uh, we also defend the faith in the theological arena. So we have many people uh, on this show from a host of different theological backgrounds, and uh, we try to bring things that will edify your walk and encourage you uh, along the way. So today we have a very special guest, and we go way, back. way back and almost to the time. That makes me sound old. Frank. Well, okay. let me tell you something. So we've got an 80s rock star yeah, well, yeah. on the show today. And that's how I first found out about him was that Jeff Lynn had music recording. So he was, he, before he was a big famous preacher. Oh, yeah. He yeah. was a big famous music guy. <laughs> and so, uh, and so I've, we've got a, we've, I've got a friend. His name is Dr. Darren Biles. Yeah. And Darren was most recently a professor preaching at the seminary, but now he's the senior pastor at First Baptist Sunnyvale. And one day Darren came up to me and he, he, he handed me this cassette tape and he said, you've got to listen to this guy. I want him to come and do a revival at my church. And so anyway, it was you, yeah, you okay. know, wow. and so I was like blown away. And then one day I got to do a revival at my home church, First Baptist Liberty City. And they said, who do you want to do to the, want to do the music? And I was like, this is a big, I got to get Jeff Lynn. So Jeff has, we've done some stuff together. And then Jeff uh, became a pastor. He'll tell you some of his history um, and of an amazing church in Corpus Christi. Mm -hmm. And then most recently has joined the staff of the Southern Baptist of Texas Convention. Now, I, I'm going to tell you right now that, you know, when I was a kid, I grew up and I loved the Dallas Cowboys. I thought that's that's the franchise. That's the top. Well, in the world, the Southern Baptist of Texas Convention, which is now led by Nathan Lorick and Tony, Dr. Tony Wolf. I mean, these guys, um, this is the most amazing cutting edge convention oh. in the United States of America. There's nothing even close. I mean, they're my people. I love, love, love them. And now I love them even more because they went and got a free agent named Jeff Lynn, and he is all that. And he is on the show today, and we don't live too far from each other. But, Jeff, tell us, uh, tell us about your, your family before we get going here today. Well, with that introduction, I'm scared to say anything at this point. <laughs> See, I may mess it all up. Yeah, I was in the concert, uh, Christian concert ministry. That's when you and I met. And that was how I met Renee uh, 35 years ago, almost to the day she walked in while I was singing a concert at Broadmoor Baptist Church in Shreveport, Louisiana. Yeah. yeah. And so we met that evening. Within a week, we knew we were getting married. And 10 months later, we got married at Prestonwood Baptist in Dallas. Wow. In fact, I had lunch yesterday with Neil Jeffrey. You know, yes, Neil? yes, Neil? quarterback. Yep. Baylor. Quarterback at Baylor. He's a legend at Baylor. And uh, he married Renee and I 34 years ago, wow. and he's still at Prestonwood. So five months later, I was leading worship uh, at a Bible conference in North Florida with South Suburna. Do you remember South? Yes. And, of course, Dr. Paige Patterson was preaching yeah. uh, that at uh, 
January Bible conference. And that's when God called me to preach five months after uh, we got married, God called me to preach. And of course, then I started graduate studies. And for the last 25 years prior to coming on staff at the SBTC, I was a pastor the last 12 years of which was at Corpus Christi, Yorktown yes. Baptist Yorktown. Great Church. We have three sons, our oldest son, 32. He was in the Navy for seven years, and now he's back in the Metroplex and looking for this next season. Uh, our middle son, Caleb, is a worship pastor in Nashville, Tennessee. He's married to Catherine, and they're expecting their first in December. They're a girl, little Clara. And then our youngest son, Micah, as we talked about a few minutes ago, Fontenot, he's a student pastor at the Cross Church in the Northwest Arkansas, and they're expecting their second son in February. So they have about almost a three-year-old son and now a new one on the way. So how many grandkids are you going to have? We're going to have three come mid-February. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, living in the Dallas-Fort Worth area obviously makes it a little closer, easily accessible to them. But anyway, that's that's a, our family. Wow. Yeah. And so, and and tell us what you do at the renowned Southern Baptist of Texas <laughs> Convention. I know, I, I'm not joking. I love these guys. Yeah. So what do you do at that amazing place? Well, I love those guys too. You yeah. know, Frank, it really is an exciting day. Um, you know, God has, in his time, he brought Nathan Lork and Tony Wolf on in their respective capacities. And so what I do is oversee the church health and leadership team, which involves, if it's not church planting, evangelism, or missions, it probably falls in our purview. And we have about 30, 35 ministry areas for which we're responsible. Churches in transition, I mean, you name it, Frank, you know, in a local church. And our, as we're going to be talking about today, my desire really is to see church uh, leaders and churches be healthy. Yeah. And what does that look like? So that's what we do. We, again, have a, a great team. We have field reps scattered throughout the state who really are kind of boots on the ground. They're meeting individually with pastors, encouraging them. And this has been a tough time, Frank, for pastors. Hmm. Very lonely isolated, uh, feel like failures. And so our field guys really are meeting with them over coffee, lunches, and breakfast just to say, hey, man, we're here to encourage you. So that's kind of what we do. That is awesome. Yeah. yeah. So uh, church health leadership, which is kind of uh, what we're going to be talking today. So the topic today is leading, serving from a healthy soul. Mm. And so I'm going to let... Uh, Jeff, kind of take it away. I'm going to inter interrupt him a Absolutely. few times. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll give you the floor, my brother. Well, I love pastors. Having been a pastor for 25 years, being uh, in ministry for 40 years, the local church for right at 30, I love the local church, and I love pastors. And I've had a privilege of speaking to a few groups in Texas when it comes to revitalization. You know, that's a real key need now, churches oh. that are uh, plateauing. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're declining. Just the need of this regenesis is our new strategy. And so I've had the privilege to speak to a lot of churches, or, or really pastors in settings about resetting. This is a great time, I think, for everybody to reset and to ask themselves, why are we doing what we do? And how do we do it in this new season? Uh, so I think it's a great time to reset, replenish, renew the vision uh, for their churches and lives. And I think they're asking, now what? Mm. You know, you know, the, you know the joke about Bubba? Bubba called 911. He yeah. said his wife had fainted. And so the dispatcher said, well, what's the address? And he said, it's 101 Chrysanthemum Drive. And so the dispatcher asked Bubba to spell it. And there was this long pause. And Bubba said, how about I drag her down to Oak Street and you pick her up there? Right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so Bubba had one of those now what moments. And I think that's what churches and leaders are thinking. Okay, coming out of COVID, hopefully, what is what does the church look like? Uh, I just heard from a pastor in Amarillo with whom we visited uh, this brand new survey that said that the top three most stressful jobs in America are, number one, a hospital administrator, a president of a private university, and third, it's pastors. Wow. The three most stressful jobs. And why is that? Because they're all emotionally charged environments. You can imagine, Frank, these pastors through COVID who sat by themselves trying to figure out, do we wear a mask? Do we not wear a mask? Do we open ourselves up, you know, for services? I had the privilege of coming from a multi-staff. We had elders with whom to collaborate, uh, to pray through uh, all these issues. But these pastors felt so isolated, lonely, and frustrated. And so they had these emotionally charged environments where they were highly uh, stressed. And, you know, the new study by Barna that said 42% of pastors wanted to resign wow. over the last year. Uh, only 1.5% of them did, but 42% of them wanted to. And it's because of the stress of the job 
And the majority of those pastors, uh, the research said that they weren't taking care of themselves. Hmm. And there is a tendency, Frank, you know, having been in ministry, that there is a tendency to want to, you know, the writer of Hebrews says that we're watching over people's souls, right? Yeah. Yeah, we're going to give an account, but we're watching over people's souls. And that's a pretty big stewardship. I think sadly, sometimes we as church leaders, uh, either leading or serving, we have a tendency to focus more on other people's souls, their well-being than our own. On the airplane, you know, the analogy, the illustration in the in the event of a loss of oxygen, if you're with a child, place a mask on yourself first and then your child, which seems counterintuitive, right? Right. But they want to make sure that you're in a capacity to take care of your child. Hmm. And this this is a, what I want to share today in the few minutes that we have is kind of an evolving talk. I've had the privilege to share this with pastors and leaders around the state. So there's a lot to this. We can't cover all of it today. But, uh, you know, are there steps to lead from the overflow of your walk with Christ? And I used to ask our people at uh, in Corpus, at Yorktown Baptist, if you wouldn't wish your life or would you wish your life in Christ on anybody else? Hmm. Right. Would you would you wish what Christ is doing in your spirit and your soul on anybody else? If not, you're probably not in a healthy posture. Yeah. And if you're a leader or serving, you're probably not leading and serving from a healthy soul. And so what are some steps that we can take uh, to lead from the overflow or a healthy soul? It's four steps real quickly. We're going to kind of focus on the first two, but to love, you know, if they're all alliterated, Tony Wolf, who's, uh, who hired me back two I years love ago. That he, guy. <laughs> he's a real deal. He's a genius. He's a genius and he loves the alliteration, but it's first of all, you love and it's based on the two great commandments, right? Love the Lord you got with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I'm not going to elaborate on that, uh, but I think that is the core, the foundation of leading from a healthy soul, that really that we're loving God with every aspect of our being. So fast forward to the second step, which is what I call live. Uh, and, and and there's a passage in Luke 10 where the an expert in the law, it says, came to Jesus and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, what does the scripture say? And the attorney right? Yeah. <laughs> the expert in the law. And he, he recited the two great commandments. And Jesus said, yeah, that's what you did good on that test. He said, do this and live. And you would think that based on the question that he asked, that Jesus is saying, if you fulfill these two great commandments, you will inherit eternal life. But that's not what Jesus is saying. Hmm. Because when he said, do this and live, the word live there means fervor and zeal and passion. It's the same idea that Jesus used in John 10, 10. You have abundant life uh, overflowing, you know, to the fullest. Uh, so I would ask our listeners, this is what I pose to pastors and leaders across the state. Are you living? That's so good. Are you really? Yeah. Are you, are you living? And would you wish your life in Christ on anybody else? And you go back to those four areas to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Uh, just when it comes to the heart, you know, Frank, you know this, you're, you're a theologian, uh, but the heart you know, it's where the emotions and the desires dwell. So amidst all of this chaos that we're facing uh, in our country, in in uh, the world, uh, are our emotions all over the map? You know, are we, or, or do they uh, ebb and flow, maybe depending on the new cycle or whatever, and our desires? I mean, we could park it there for a while, Um but when you when you think about the heart, Frank, I man, I don't want to put you on the spot because uh, I'm used to the podcast that Tony and I do. We kind of interact and dialogue. But when you think of loving God with all of your heart, what does that what does that mean to you? Uh, you know, I, I think about the scripture that says, "As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he." So you know, so I'm always guarding my heart and my mind, and you know, I'm not sure where the the difference is in them yeah. sometimes, but I know it's important. Mm -hmm. You know that you know, the heart, how I feel and the mind, how I think. And those two kind of go together a whole bunch. So that's where I'm always at. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's true. I, you know, I, when I got to, we've been with the convention now for two years, we moved up here roughly two years ago uh, in Roanoke. And so I had to establish a practice with a doctor. And the first thing they said, did, did was they said, we want to check your heart. Mm. And of course I just turned 60. Uh, and they said, Hey, we want to, we want to, uh, to, you know, give your heart a test because we've seen guys who are your age and look like they're incredibly fit and they go from the, the examination room to the emergency room for emergency surgery. So, you know, I didn't know what to expect. I felt good. Yeah. 
Uh, but I think if we want to talk about loving God with all of our heart, let's let's compare it to the physical heart. I, I think here's the way mm -hmm. that you can begin to love God with all your heart. First of all, have a heart examination. Examine your heart. Uh, you know, the psalmist said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my concerns and if there's any offensive way in me. And I, I think it may be a great time for us to have a heart test, a heart examination, just to say, okay, take some time away. Lord, here's my kind of shine your spotlight of your Holy Spirit on my life and see if there's any heart issues of mine. Uh, inter interestingly enough, I was talking to some uh, pastors in uh, North Richland Hills yesterday, and I asked them, I said, how do you, how do you think, what's a good way to examine your heart? And a guy said endurance. Hmm. So if you're, if you're on a hike, and he was, he was on a hike with his family, and he ran out of breath, he felt like he couldn't make it down. So that was a test. And if there's ever a time, Frank, that we need endurance, yeah, it's now. Mm -hmm. I mean, perseverance. I'm reading a book uh, by John Elder. It's called Resilient, mm -hmm. uh, Restoring a Soul in These Turbulent Times. Uh, so do do a heart examination. Just say, okay, you know, God, what does that look like? Uh, I think secondly, you got to exercise your heart. If you want a, a heart that loves God, uh, you got to exercise it. And I, and I think when it comes to the physical realm. I do cardiovascular exercises. I try to eat right. All those things I do to exercise, you know, resistance training and the like. And I think in the spiritual realm, that exercising your heart, uh, and I may get you to think about this uh, too, Frank, but um, I think prayer is a good exercise, Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think the word is a good exercise. I think being involved in community, mm -hmm. which is something that Renee and I, you know, having been a pastor for 25 years and moving up here, trying to get connected, because I'm gone being an interim pastor and all that type of thing. But I think community is a good exercise because you get to evaluate your heart in light of people in a room who, with whom you might be impatient or unkind, intolerant, <laughs> that type of thing. So what do you think when it comes to exercising your heart? How would you, how would you do that? Oh, I think you're right. I mean, you're nailing it because I mean, when you, it takes, it takes effort to read. It takes effort to pray, exercise, to do yeah. these things. So I think if you don't do those things, you're going to, you know, have problems, right? Yeah. You're going to, you know, disintegrate, degenerate. Yeah. Whatever happens when you don't exercise. Atrophy. Atrophy. Yeah. yeah. That's a good word. Yeah. Well, I, I, I don't even have this in my notes here, but First Timothy 4, 7, you know, Paul told Timothy what? Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. And that mm -hmm. word discipline, you know, gumnazo. Yeah. Right? It's the word from where we get our English word gymnasium, which implies exercise, discipline, time, and trouble. So I do think it's a, it's a discipline to exercise your heart through all those, those ways. And then thirdly, when it comes to uh, your heart, I think you got to guard your heart. You know, I try to guard my heart against those things that, um, uh, against heart disease, uh, all the, you know, I, in fact, I'm taking some supplements. My doctor said, Hey, you know, eat healthy, take some supplements, uh, to help guard your heart against all this stuff. But I think there's three things. These are sub points of the, <laughs> uh, but I think you have to guard yourself against activity. Hmm. So what do I mean by that? I, I think that we can get so busy that we sometimes confuse busyness with godliness or busyness with um, effectiveness. And we live in a busy, a busy time. And remember the story of Mary and Martha. We all know the classic story. Jesus walks in and Martha's griping because Mary's just sitting down there listening to Jesus. Yeah. And, and I, you know, Jesus rebuked Martha. And if Jesus ever says your name twice, oh. probably not a good thing, right? Right. Yeah, so Martha, Martha, <laughs> what did he say? You are distracted with much serving. And then he said, you're worried about so many different things. And only one thing is important. And Mary's got it right. And Frank, people use that story. Those who are busybodies, they use that to justify their business. Jesus rebuked Martha. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? Yes. He just said, this is not the way it's supposed to go down. And so I think guard yourself against activity. There's some great books out there that talk about just slowing down, um, redeeming every moment. Uh, and we, I think we need to do that, Frank. I, you're driven. You got that person. I, I'm driven. We, we want to be busy, but we can't ever forsake our walk with Christ. So we have to guard against activity. Uh, and then secondly, you have to guard against adversity. You know, marriages, um, sometimes adversity just destroys the relationship between a husband and wife, when in essence, they need to be drawn together mm -hmm. to be strengthened. And I just wonder during the season, has COVID 
and other adversities led us to want to mistrust God, yeah. to doubt God, you know, even in the political realm and the, what's going on in the world. Do we, do we really believe that God is sovereign mm -hmm. and is in control? I mean, what do you think about that when it comes to guarding against adversity in your heart? Um, you got anything to add to that? Uh, well, you know, we got to trust God and not man. And also, too, there's always that battle to, to trust in yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if it involves a person, then, we're, you know, we're probably looking in the wrong place and we're probably looking at a crash ending of some sort. A crash ending. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I would just say against adversity. And then thirdly, you want to guard your heart against adultery um, in the spiritual sense. You, you see this terminology all through Scripture in the Old Covenant, right? God accuses people of, of uh, you know, prostituting themselves to other gods, uh, pursuing other gods. Uh, James, the half brother of Jesus, said, "You adulteresses, don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God?" So I, we have to guard against our desires uh, pursuing other things. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, Frank, there's a great, you know, this in, in the book of uh, at the latter part of the book of Joshua, when God's people are finally going to head to the promised land, uh, he, he tells them to do two things. Primarily, do two things: when you go into the land for the conquest, tear down the idols, drive out the inhabitants. Right. Yes. You're, entering a, you're entering a pagan territory. And so tear down the idols and drive out the inhabitants. And you look at the first two chapters of Judges and you see all these tribes. It says they did not. They did not. They did not. And, and the Lord knew if you don't drive them out, they're going to become a snare to you. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah. So you know, I wonder if, if there are those idols and inhabitants in our lives, those idols that we've refused to tear down. Yeah, we avoid them for a while. Or the inhabitants, we let them reside for a while in our heart. But over time, what happens? They resurface, and we embrace the very things that we should have driven out and torn down. So to me, guarding against adultery is those very things, eliminating anything that might even raise its ugly head toward, uh, you know, drawing your affections. Um, so I think, you know, loving God with all of our heart, soul, and mind, and are you really living Again, would you wish your life in Christ on anybody else? Um, and when it talks about loving others, uh, you know, loving your neighbors yourself, how do you know that you're loving others? Well, love is patient and love is kind. We could start with those two. Yes. I mean, we talk about <laughs> when it comes to our relationship with our family, are we patient and are we kind? Or are we manifesting love? And then we could go into a lot of other things about, you know, loving God with all your strength. Uh, and I, I do think we, our we have to understand our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And are we taking care of our temples? You know, if, if some of our church leaders and pastors were to walk into their worship center the Sunday morning and see the carpet ripped, the chairs turned over, the pews, you know, demolished and graffiti on the wall, they'd probably probably be a little upset. But I wonder, are we as equally upset with how we're treating our own temple? Hmm. You know, the, 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 the heart, the body in which the Spirit of God resides. And, you know, we're all, con you know, everything's connected, mm -hmm. Frank. I mean, it's it's um, what happens in the body sometimes happens in the soul and it's affected. So I would I would encourage our listeners, your listeners to take care of themselves physically. And when you're so busy and frustrated, uh, one of the last things you want to do is to take care of yourself. And, and as I said earlier in that survey, uh, pastors who wanted to resign were not taking care. You know, the yeah. self-care was a huge uh, negligent area. And so taking care, you know, honoring God, loving God with your heart, your strength, your mind. How's your mind these days? What's the narrative? Hmm. Are you believing the narrative on the news cycles? Are you believing <laughs> the narrative of the gospel, you know, from the Old Testament you know, to the New Testament? Um, does this make sense? Yes. Yeah. So I think loving God with all of your mind, uh, you know, we have, have our mind saturated on the things of the Lord as well. So you love, then you live. Thirdly, real quickly, you, you, you learn. When I first went on staff at the convention, I was asked to give a talk on leadership. And Frank, honestly, a lot of things in the leadership uh, arena came naturally intuitive to me. Hmm. And so now it had to be on a strategic level. How do you communicate leadership? Uh, and uh, as pastors, uh, we're called to lead, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Yeah. Shepherd the flock of God among you. And that's leading and feeding. And Psalms, and I was drawn to this verse. You, it's, it's one of those things that you've read all your life, but you never read it. You never saw it. Psalm 78, 72. 78 is when God is retelling the history uh, and reminding 
his people of what, how faithful he was. And at the end of that, he talks about raising David up. And it said, he, David shepherded them with a pure heart and he guided them with skillful hands. Hmm. I think leadership is heart and hands. You can't have one without the other, That's right? Good. Yeah. Yeah. So you, 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 sometimes you can't teach heart. You can teach hands, but a pure heart and hands. And so what skills are that you need to learn in the respective areas in which you serve? For me, I always wanted to grow better as a preacher. Mm -hmm. I wanted to grow more as a leader. I wanted to learn. And so I think if you're going to lead from the overflow, don't stop learning. I listen to podcasts, you know, Frank, and I know you're, you're constantly learning. That's I mean, you've I, had to learn. I do. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just by nature of the job that you have, but by your very heartbeat for the things of God, you're always learning. And you can't stop learning. I right. mean, there's a great story about uh, when Rick Warren in Saddleback was just exploding. Uh, the, uh, one of the guys in the room, there was eight to ten passions, Ed Young, John Bassanio, you know, the champions of the faith, W.A. Criswell. Mm -hmm. And so Rick Warren, somebody, I think Ed Young asked Rick to, hey, share some, share what's going on at Saddleback. What are some principles? And whoever was in the room that told me the story said, W.A. Criswell was over there taking notes. Wow. <laughs> Right. You're never wow. too old to learn. Yeah. And I'm 62 and I, I love just it, just want to grow and uh, learn. So I think when you're leading from a healthy soul, uh, you want to keep learning. And then lastly, you want to lead. Right. You want to love. Uh, you want to you want to live it. And I think that's the most important aspect of this whole talk. Uh, you want to keep growing uh, and learning. And then you want to you want to lead and you want to lead if you're a spiritual leader. You know, Peter said, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight. So that whole passage, you know, he says, you want to lead willingly, you want to lead eagerly, and you want to lead exemplary, hmm. right? Yeah. Those three areas. And so there's there's a lot to all of this. Um, so that's what I would ask. Would you, you're probably not le leading or serving from the overflow or a healthy soul if you wouldn't wish your life in Christ on anybody else. So, um, that's, 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 that's it. Well, this that's is, not all of it, but that's most of it. Oh, yeah. this is excellent. So I, I hope that everybody listening to this will share this and, uh, share this with the friend that you know, that needs to hear it, uh, that can be encouraged. Uh, you are listening right now to Jeff Lynn with the Southern Baptist of Texas convention, and he is over leadership and health. And that's what we've been hearing about today. So uh, as we close here, Jeff, tell us, um, how can we keep up with you, uh, find any of your resources, your sermons online, anything? You to tell us where everything is. Well, I don't know where everything is. I know when it comes to SBT, uh, SBTC, sbtexas.com, that's our website. There's a litany. I mean, Frank, you know mm -hmm. the resources. that are, I, I had no idea when I came on staff two years ago, all the resources that we have. And it may take some digging, you know, uh, but there are some excellent resources uh, out there and we're willing to serve. That's what we do. We serve the churches. So sbtexas.com and sermon videos, I guess it would be to some of the websites of the two interims at which I've, I've served. Um, uh, it looks like I'm getting ready to uh, serve in another interim capacity. I don't know when this drops. But um, so we can probably type your name in the uh, search engine on YouTube and stuff will come up. Yeah, there's no telling. What I, that's how I listen. Yeah. To OK. All right. Yeah. So don't confuse me with Jeff Lynn of ELO, the Electric Light Orchestra, who has an E in his last name. So, oh. yeah. Yeah. There's been some confusion. He's a lot older than I am. Yeah. yeah. So, you anyway, know, that's how they can... equally talented. No, no, no. He's <laughs> yeah, no, no. Much more talented. So, yeah. <laughs> well, you've been listening to Jeff Lynn. And uh, it's an amazing podcast. So please share this with a friend. We pray that you have been blessed listening to this episode. And we will see you in the next episode of Defending the Faith. Mm.